I would like to invite up to the stage Dr. Kirin Patel and Caitlin Grasso, founder and CEO of Generation, and Ramesh Sambasivan, president of the Tampa Bay um, Thai and principal of Silicon Glades. This next panel will be discussing weaving social impact into business culture. Increasingly, we've become more aware that firms that are profitable also have an impact in society and ecology. And the firms that are most profitable in our economy are the ones that focus on the triple bottom line. So focusing both on the environment and social good. So this next discussion will highlight some of those issues. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Taylor Wallace. And first off, I just wanna thank you all for, for having us here. Uh, we have an awesome panel today of, of people that are doing some pretty incredible things. Uh, so to start off, I'd, I'd like to just ask you all if you could talk about what it is you do that has a social impact, um, how that's part of, of your business, your life, uh, and why you choose to do that. Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Grosso. I'm the founder and CEO of Generation, which is uh, the largest media company in the United States that connects young women in high school and college with companies to promote career exploration. I started it about two years ago when I was a junior in the undergrad program at the Wharton School of Business, and I started Generation because I grew up in a really empowered environment. I have a supportive dad, I went to an all-girls school, and when I went to college and I studied finance, I realized that there was such a lack from what young women saw and what, they, what women were advancing to in corporate America, in politics, in, uh, in academia, so I really wanted to find a business solution to close that gap that could bring girls and companies together and would provide valuable returns to the company. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I am a physician by training, vicariously went into managed healthcare, and I say that because when I was early on in my life, I was not looking at a patient's insurance, but I was looking at a patient as a patient. And when in 80s the HMO came in, everybody was running away from it, and I embraced, and I went into that business. So the topic today is anything you do has an aspect of helping the society and the community. Question is, what is your priority? I've always said that there is no harm or crime in making money, but it's how you make money. So when I look at my healthcare company, I see that as a tool of providing healthcare to millions of people in this country who cannot afford regular even Medicare. HMOs are there, it has its own problems and that were there in the early on, but there must be something good where about 60% of the country is looking at that aspect of care. So I'll just tell you that in that way, I see an opportunity where I am able to provide care to a senior citizen who has a choice between healthcare and food. So it is those type of things. Also then I've been able to go into fields of education and other areas that I will expand on if there is time allowed. I run a design and innovation firm called Silicon Glades and part of that Part of its mission is to help corporations and organizations tap into their social conscience so that whatever they undertake has got social impact, whether it's a business process or anything else that they do. And one of the projects that I do within social, uh, Silicon Glades is called Alligator Zone, and it is uh, one where children and youth are exposed to innovation in a local area by bringing them in front of startup company founders for a product show and tell. So for this particular panel, a lot of my uh, thinking and uh, words will be informed by the experience of exposing products to a very young audience who are the future consumers. So that's great. Um, so in terms of, of, there's a lot of talk of today in, in the corporate world of 
making a social impact, diversity programs, inclusion, uh, why are we seeing this societal shift towards companies, for-profit organizations, wanting to make some sort of social impact? I think, well, uh, what Dr. Patel was saying, that doing good and making money should not be mutually exclusive things, and I think a lot of companies are trying to figure out how they can make the world a better place through their daily operations. And for me, particularly dealing with gender diversity, um, and there's a lot of research that supports that. So NBC News just recently released a report uh, ranking countries where it was the best place to be a girl in terms of job prospects, education prospects, and the United States ranks 42nd on that list. And I think that's despicable. Uh, and you know, one of the most advanced nations that girls in other countries have more opportunities than girls do here. And they find that companies that have um, females on their board of directors actually perform three times financially better than other boards that do not. So I think companies try to figure out what's the best way we can incorporate them. And for them, it's all about the people. So what we do at Generation is how can we help companies develop their pipeline through more our, our uh, community of more than 75,000 young women. So, what I say is everybody wakes up in the morning, I believe, thinking, how can I be a positive contributor? There are very few people in the world that wake up in the morning to say how I can do something bad. So fundamentally, it is inherent in every one of us that we would like to do something good. And if you look at it in the past or many a times, it has been the men and women with means who have been able to do something or contribute to the society. And by that I only mean from the financial side. But when you look at it, lots and lots of people give their time and energy, which I feel is a lot more valuable because time is a commodity that you don't control. And if you could use that commodity, although many a times they do not get the recognition, I believe the contribution of time of an individual is far more valuable than dollars from some person. I think as the world has moved progressively to the corporate side, this culture of allowing the employees to contribute, matching contributions from the employees, etc., many ways and tools that you see today that are impacting the world. And I am glad that there, are, there is now a focus on that area and as we focus on it, I, I, am, I believe we will see a lot and more impact on the society at large. I think picking up from what Dr. K said about time and freeing people from their desks. So I think the internet uh, has, has liberated people from their desks and they are able to be more involved with the next generation. So that probably has got something to do with uh, the awareness of, you know, having social impact. So that probably is uh, something that's uh, all pervasive everywhere. So, Dr. K, you said something about how the world is increasingly more corporate. Uh, and one of the beautiful things about entrepreneurship, investing, is it's pretty black and white in terms of what success looks like. You make a profit or you don't. Uh, in terms of social impact, how are companies and organizations measuring their success and, and what does that look like? Measuring success, everything does not have an objective endpoint, so it's a challenge. But the start point of at least thinking of creating an impact is the right step. And in that sense, I believe when a culture in education and in a corporation, one of the aspects is clearly defined that part of our goal is to create an impact on the world footprint in a positive way. And I bring this because in the past, as you can see, 
uh, lots of industry, chemical, coal, whatever you want to name it, the primary goal was profit and profit alone. There were no checks and balances of the evil impact it had on the society at large. And that culture of making people aware, both from regulatory standpoint, hopefully not over-regulated, but individual taking that responsibility themselves is a right step and I see that happening more and more. Uh, who is contributing to it? Why is difficult for me to answer? But I am glad that there are people who want to put society above profit. And all I am telling is uh, we want to do the right things, but at the same time, Profit is going to be a driving factor and one cannot go away from that fact. Um, so, you know, let us as people individually and all entrepreneurs try to keep in mind that we want to do both aspects and there are ways of doing both of them. Any, any other comments from, from either of you? I would just say that I think it might be like the financial side of me uh, from Wharton that, you know, always believes that numbers speak louder than words. So I think when people go into social ventures, they really focus on telling the qualitative story, having a customer or user saying, this changed my life, this gave me this opportunity, which is really important. And you need that qualitative aspect, but you also need the quantitative aspect. And for every social venture, that's going to be different. So, you you know, if you can show metrics to, a, you know, clients and say, we reached 10 million people this summer and this is how many girls we were able to, you know, place into different positions, and this is how much money we saved you by, you know, you being a client of ours. I think if you can quantify that and have some nice charts that sh show growth, it makes it a really easy decision for why people should continue to be engaged with you. So it's really a marriage between the quantitative and qualitative aspect that I think are important for any solid as venture. I think every business has to be a social venture. Uh, just because that has become now a buzzword, social venture, uh, doesn't mean that they have to forego charging people money for it. Because if you think about it, trying to convince donors about the value of giving back to a certain organization, so let us say it's a nonprofit organization versus a social venture, the effort that goes into passing around a bowl trying to demonstrate value, I I think is a lot more than finding an economic justification for you to simply exist. And then once you have that economic justification, it becomes a lot more easier to scale it as a business while doing good. So I spend a lot of time thinking about corporate recruiting. Uh, and, and one of the things that we see is that millennials especially are looking for deeper meaning in the work that mm -hmm. they are willing to take on. Um, so what are some of those societal shifts, especially amongst a younger generation, that you're seeing where they want to work for companies that are either social ventures uh, or have some kind of, of giving back baked into their job? You want to take it? Sure. I work with a lot of youth through a couple of programs that I launched here in Tampa. One is with the help of friends, it's called Coder Dojo. We, children are learning coding for free because people come together. Uh, the other is Alligator Zone. Uh, kids learn problem solving through design thinking just by directly getting exposed to the innovative process, directly interacting with founders. And uh, I think, um, it always surprises the founders who present at Alligator Zone how perceptive the young kids are. They can be as young as seven years old. So they are really, really perceptive. They understand complex technologies. They understand concepts like privacy, environmental friendliness, and whether something is good or bad. So for a business, if they can just run it through that simple filter, what would a three-year-old think about this product? I think that's a very simple litmus test that they can apply 
and quickly realize that you know they can they allow room for improvement. I think um, to your point about the millennial generation, I think nowadays um, everyone, uh, the younger generation and people in general are saying, what kind of impact am I going to make on this world? What type of legacy am I going to leave? And traditionally it used to be, you know, you go to work and then you leave and on the weekends maybe you do volunteering. But since people are spending so much time at their jobs, they, cert they may not have time to volunteer. So they're looking for opportunities where they can give back and make a meaningful difference in their work. So if they know, even if I'm working 12, 16 hour days, if I'm working in impact investing. I know that my work is having a real result on someone. So I think people sort of want to sort of combine the best of both worlds. And in the past, that hasn't been the case. But now with a lot of companies like Tom's, Warby Parker, they're allowing people to do that. So every day, you know, whether you work in finance or if you're a coder for that company, you're still having an impact in providing value. Dr. Kay, in, in your work with university students, have you seen a change in their outlook on the world in terms of the, the type of work that they want to do since, say, when you were, were studying? I think education has always been an evolution. What I can do or talk about is the College of Sustainability. And I bring that because if you think about our lifestyle in the United States, and as other parts of the world are aspiring and reaching that standard, the world resources are getting so scarce that if we were to live the lifestyle that we live here around the globe, then three worlds or four worlds resources will not be adequate. And what does that mean? is we will have to find ways of conservation, sustainability or sustenance, etc. And hence, when I was at USF and looking at opportunities to invest in education, I felt the College of Sustainability will be something that will create a positive impact on the world and come up with a generation of kids or children that are going to go into the world with a thought of how to make this a better world. And almost every university in the United States has a focus on sustainability or aspects of sustainability, but there are only two colleges of sustainability in the Northern America, and USF is one of them. So when I had the opportunity of doing something, I felt, let me invest in an aspect that for generations to come are going to produce human beings that are now trained and educated to improve the world by having the same amount of food that can be better distributed, energy better utilized. Uh, I think Yogi is here. He is one of the pioneers in the world in sustainable uh, electricity, etc. So uh, I think with evolution and opportunities, both are, are coming to the table and it will continue to happen. And, and this is not the first time and this is not the last time. So I, I see this as an evolving process and, and uh, as the needs changes, the human beings are gonna react and that's where we are right now. So in terms of the idea of, of creating a social enterprise, Caitlin, I know you, you've had experience recently doing this. Mm -hmm. um, is it something that, is it a 50-50 split where it's you know half of our efforts, like a Tom's or a Warby Parker, are going to go towards giving and half are for profit? How is that structured and, and 
How do you look at that? That's a great question. I really think it's a, a crucial part of everything we do. So when we were starting Generation, and what our goal is, is that how can we be the number one destination for the young woman who wants to take over the world? And it's providing that young woman, high school and college women, with all of those resources, events, opportunities to um, interview with companies, meet female executives, and focusing really on the person and making sure they're getting an amazing user experience. And then when you have such a loyal following, you can say, what value can I provide to other stakeholders? So it just became a natural progression that we would work with companies and charge them and they would be our clients for pipeline development efforts or through marketing efforts or through product development market research efforts so I really think about not saying how can I just get as much money as possible from the companies which of course is a goal but how are the two groups the girls and the companies going to speak together in a synergistic way um, as our speaker said earlier synergy is really important in bringing everybody together so if you're trying to you know fit two things that don't go well together it can provide a lot of of mixed incentives. If companies are giving us money for just to collect data on girls, which is something we won't do. Um, so really knowing what your values are and putting your business model together around that. So to, to kind of pass that off to, to Ramesh a little bit, what do you see in terms of working with kids and entrepreneurs and looking towards the future? What do, what does the corporate landscape look like? Do companies become B Corps? Do we have more social ventures being founded? I tried really hard to get the attorney who drafted the law for B Benefits Corporation from Philadelphia, actually. <laughs> Bill Clark could not. He had a scheduling issue. So they, they have drafted this law, and it's available in certain states. Uh, I think it has to come from the grassroots. You cannot expect a corporation to look away from profits. So I think it's going to happen without our knowledge. And uh, it almost is like how, uh, you know, if you look at conflict minerals, it's become an issue, right? It is visible. I just read in today's Wall Street Journal that coffee coming out of the Republic of Congo, again, is involved with conflict. So trying to bring awareness uh, about these kinds of issues so that the end product in the hands of the consumer is something that has actually improved somebody's life down the supply chain. I think those kinds of things will happen without being called a social venture or a benefits corp. It will happen automatically because that's the way the next generation of consumers are going to drive, you know, drive the wallet, their, their money. So that's, they'll speak with their wallets. Any comments from either of you on that? Well, I think, um, in, I, I do believe that it has to come from within. But at the same time, the leadership in the companies and in the education, if the culture is brought in. So I believe that as long as when we have business graduate, other graduates, if one can grill into them that monetary profit is not the only goal, but a social impact along with it, whether it is 5%, 50%, 100% is a different issue, but a culture that is brought into the generation to come that the society and profit both, both should go hand in hand is something that we should all be encouraging and looking towards. Similarly, as he mentioned, the consumer should also pay more attention to whether their dollar spent is impacting only the bottom line of a company and his own by that I mean the least expensive product versus spending a little bit more and supporting a goal. To that level, when the society will change, I don't know, but it's a role played by all aspects and all people, both business, consumers, and everybody, to be educated to see what impact they are able to create when they spend a dollar or when they buy something versus when they sell something. So let's see where we go. May I add something to that? Yeah. 
So this concept of measurable impact is so ingrained that they want to see numbers. So for example, when I presented Alligator Zone to uh, the Knight Foundation, they wanted to see impact that can be projected. But at the same time, in the city of Mountain View, I was told that there are underprivileged families who show up for the program and the little kids there are now able to dream big because they are actually seeing local products and they can now see themselves in those shoes. They have something to go home and talk to uh, with their parents because it's a shared experience. There is tremendous impact. I've been told so many times, do not give up on this program because it's not an easy one to run and expand you know, without dollars. So how do, you, how do you change the culture of grant giving organizations to say when you decide that you want to apply these metrics of impact, you have to also look at non-cash metrics. That's very hard. So there's undoubtedly many challenges with, with trying to create a social venture or make social impact inside an existing organization. Are there any advantages to taking a company and, and really focusing on making a social impact or creating a, a socially focused organization that a purely for-profit company doesn't have? Well, I think uh, it's a better story, and I think I can pull at people's heartstrings a lot better, uh, and that's sort of what gets people to, you know, write checks and, you know, sign on as clients. And I think what is really key in a struggle that you can run into when you're starting a social venture is that you have to have a very clear um, value proposition for the company because, oh, they, they love how everybody's changing the world, but, you know, they're a business and they have to justify this to their boss. Where is this coming from? So in the early days, I would always, you know, be pitching companies and I'd always say, oh, you know, you need to go talk to the, the foundation branch. And I'd go like, this isn't gonna work because we're not a 501c3. And then you get routed 15 emails later, sorry, it's not gonna work out. So it took sort of getting early traction, testimonials from girls, testimonies from the smaller companies that were willing to you know bite on to say, look, here are the results. These are how many girls were hired. These are how many uh, companies signed on. This is our audience reach. And then it became much clearer. So now when I go in and I sort of have, this is the business case and this is what's going to, you know, pull at your heartstrings, it's usually, you know, a win-win deal. So I think that is uh, more compelling uh, for people. I will come to my phrase that do the right things for right reasons and the right result will follow. So how you want to put it is a different issue, but f the core value and principle that you believe in is something that has to be a central point. So when you talk about a impact on society, if you genuinely believe that and that's your core mission, you have to stick to it and sooner or later you will see the outcome to it. So I believe that having, as she mentioned, a core principle that you believe in and that being part of the mission of the company is a very important aspect. But once you believe in something and if it is the right thing, then do not make compromises along the way, either for profit or for some other reasons on your core belief, as long as that belief is right, right? So belief, to believe in something and core value is one issue, so this is not a very simple aspect, um, but there are Sometimes somebody can say hooks, but I, I would venture to say that focus on your core mission. So as a company, your core mission is always to be able to survive, means be in existence. Otherwise you can have the many, many dreams and virtues and whatever it may be, but if you can't survive in business, it's not gonna work. So balancing the two, but then remaining focused on your core value as an anchor will be very important. Just to add.
add a, a quick story to that about not compromising on your values. So we're currently raising uh, a seed round, and I was pitching to a really large uh, VC group, and at the end of the presentation, one of the, the lead investors said to me, I love this, but I would really like to invest in this if you opened it up to um, boys as well. And I'm like, well, the name's Jen Huration, uh, not Jen Himation. Uh, but uh, so I was really sort of taken aback because this is sort of the guiding principle by what we work for. Um, and so I just sort of knew that if it meant sort of I would have to change what I believed in to get their money, then they probably were not the right investors for me. But it has to come from a very deep-seated uh, belief that, oh, although this would make them happy and get us cash really quickly, it's just not the right rabbit hole to go down. Can I throw it back to you? What, for, for to Taylor, for review, what, and I look at you as a document, uh, document, uh, documentarian of corporate culture because of your software. What trends do you see? We really see two things, and I've, I've kind of tried to gear my questions towards that. And, and the first is I think that the generation graduating from college today, entering the workforce, uh, they absolutely want to find meaning in what they do. They want purpose. Uh, they want to work for an organization that they know is, is in some way changing the world, causing an impact. Uh, and I think, again, a, a lot of that is, is not just going up and every Friday we go do an, a Habitat for Humanity build or we go once a quarter and, and volunteer our time. It's, you know, the code that I'm writing is going to impact someone's life. Um, and I think that companies that generate value ethically in the market oftentimes do things like that. They just don't tell the story to the young people. So it's really realigning the way that businesses talk about uh, what it is that they do, how that delivers value to people so that a younger generation understands it. Storytelling is the key. Yeah. That's it. I didn't want to be the moderator here. <laughs> <laughs> didn't mean to be. <laughs> So I, I think we're about out of time. Ramesh, did you have any closing comments? No. Anything, Dr. K? No. I think I'll, sorry, go we'll, ahead. We'll be available for <laughs> private discussions, but, uh, you know, this is a trend that's happening, and I, I only encourage every one of the person in this room to look at societal impact versus profit all the time. Is there any closing ask you guys would like to make of the audience, where they can find your work that you're doing, something that you'd like them to, to check out? One thing I wanted to say is there's a lot that can be done just by asking people to donate time, uh, like Dr. K said, which is a very precious resource. And I have proven there are programs that I have built that are purely using time of volunteers, and you can do phenomenal work. And Thai Tampa Bay is a perfect example of that. We, this thing would not be possible without so much time put in by so many volunteers. Everyone is a volunteer here. Um, I would say, uh, this is my first time in Tampa, we're actually in, uh, based out of New York City, but every summer uh, we host an epic summer tour, and our last summer tour was we chartered a giant purple bus and drove around the United States and visited 60 of the most innovative companies in America to show girls what it's like to work there and find jobs. So we're adding cities to our 2017 tour and considering Tampa on our list, so if there's any, yes, okay, uh, if there's any uh, corporations, you know, companies that you think we should be visiting, please find me because I'm trying to get a better understanding of the landscape. She's closing the sale. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.